Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you care to take your seats, if you haven't already, we'll, we'll make a start. Um, thank you very much for joining us for a discussion on a subject of both jurisprudential and practical interest, exercising and resisting the mortgagee's power of sale. Um, my name's Rena Sofronio. I am with great presumption seeking to play the part of the great Lord Melvin Bragg when he hosts his irresistible podcast in our time. I can't do the accent, but I will try and be as argumentative as uh, he is. Um, with me to discuss aspects of the mortgagee's power of self from the respective viewpoints of disgruntled mortgagor, cautious but canny mortgagee, and hapless but opportunistic incoming third party purchaser are two of Green's List property law specialists. Uh, on the far side, Robert Hay, author of The Mortgagee's Power of Sale, um, now happily in its third edition. So if you don't have the 2012, run to your all good textbook shops and snaffle your coffee. And uh, David Lloyd next to me, um, who has for some years now been an assistant to the author of Vumard Sale of Land, um, updating the work. We'll see how we run in terms of time, and if time permits, uh, we may be able to take questions at the end, but it's a fairly full um, talk this morning. Robert, if I can start with you, a uh, frequent ground for complaint by a mortgagor um, who's faced with a mortgagee sale is that the mortgagee invariably exercising a statutory right in the Australian jurisdictions um, is acting exclusively in pursuit of its own interests without regard for what would be considered the mortgagor's, uh, the equity of redemption, the, the remaining interest for a mortgagor. There are inherent conflicts of interest between the two, aren't there? Well, uh, there are conflicts, um, but we seem to have reached the position where, certainly in Victoria, um, a mortgagee is entitled to look after its own interests primarily, but in doing so can't uh, willfully or recklessly prejudice the um, mortgagor's interests and is obliged to obtain the best price possible in the circumstances. That's a really broad summary. I'm sure we're going to deal with it a, a little bit more in detail about what that actually means. But certainly, um, mortgagee, mortgagors commonly come in and seek advice and seem to think that everything is stacked against them. It's not so. But on the other hand, the mortgagee is certainly entitled to protect its own interests primarily. Um, the jurisprudential interest in this topic for me chiefly lies in the debate that um, Australian courts inherited. Um, the cases as to the relevant standard to which a mortgagee is to be held by courts in realising its security. Um, there's a common law and equity pedigree in the language that's used to describe that standard um, in the articulation of the respective tests, reasonable care on the one hand, acting in good faith on the other. Could you briefly summarise the debate? What are the competing articulations of the tests that have been applied? Well, in Victoria, we still follow the equitable uh, duty of good faith. Um, New South Wales has the same thing, but has now, since um, uh, November 2011, also had a requirement that a mortgagee obtain the best price that may reasonably be obtained in the circumstances. So that actually has lifted the standard. Um, Queensland, for many years, has had a reasonable, uh, reasonable price in the circumstances. And, of course, most of you would be aware Section 4, 420A of the Corporations Act also requires a, um, a controller to obtain the best price possible in the circumstances. I, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not... That's not a direct quote, but that's roughly what it means. And that's certainly a slightly higher standard that we have in Victoria. Um, in England, they have a more of a negligence standard, um, though they've also been slowly moving away from that. But in no circumstances as a, are a, is a mortgagee liable for mere carelessness. There's, in no jurisdiction is that the case. What... Um, this is for either of you gentlemen. What contribution has the MBF Investments Proprietary Limited and Nolan um, Victorian Court of Appeal decision uh, made to this issue? I would say... Uh, I would say that it fairly much confirms the uh, 
uh, the position. Um, it, it certainly doesn't break new ground. There's nothing revolutionary about it. Would you uh, agree with that? Um, yeah. MBF and Nolan had great publicity here in Victoria because it went on for ages and got to the Court of Appeal. It certainly didn't add to the law. Um, however, for those that are interested at paragraph 100, there's a very succinct summary of the law. And perhaps, I, I'm, I'm not, this is not a session to read things, but I'm going to briefly summarise it. At paragraph 100, the Court of Appeal said, a mortgagee is not a trustee of the power of sale, which is given to the mortgagor to enable the realisation of a security interest. A mortgagee must act in good faith and cannot sell for a purpose other than that for which the power of a sale is conferred. It's not required to place the interests of the mortgagor above the mortgagee's interests in recovering the debt. It can sell the property at any time it chooses, um, even though the property might realise a higher price if the sale date is postponed. It cannot disregard the interests of the mortgagor by simply selling for a price which would cover the uh, amount of the loan and must take reasonable steps to obtain the best price consistent with its right to enforce its security interests. So that's, that's the test really now. The mortgagee must take reasonable steps to obtain the best price consistent with its right to enforce a security interest. This requires the mortgagee to consider how the property should be advertised and to allow an appropriate time between the advertisements and the sale. It must also have regards to the interests of subsequent security holders and there are a couple of other issues the case is interesting for which we'll probably discuss later. Um. I might say at this stage a few things about uh, what, what can a mortgagor do uh, in terms of uh, interfering with the, with the sale process. Um, I suppose the first point to make is that there's two opportunities that a mortgagor has to do, uh, has to do that. Uh, one of them is before uh, the actual sale itself, and by sale I mean contract, and the second chance, if you like, is once a contract's been entered into, but prior to completion. Um, the way um, that is done uh, is by going to the court and seeking an interlocutory um, injunction to restrain the sale or to restrain completion, whichever point uh, the uh, process is at. Um, there are um, various ways uh, that um, uh, a mortgagor can proceed. I'll, I'll uh, we'll go into that in more detail a little bit later on, but uh, um, essentially um, before, before the sale there would be uh, the opportunity for the mortgagor to say that some precondition to the exercise of the power of sale has not been met. So, for instance, um, there isn't any default in the first place, uh, there was not uh, a, a valid uh, uh, notice of default or, or demand pursuant to the mortgage, um, and, of course, after the sale, uh, the, um, the classic uh, grizzle is that the, the price was not adequate, it was below value, and, and that ties in very neatly uh, with uh, what Rob has just said about the uh, uh, MBF and Nolan case and the point that the, um, the mortgagee is bound to exercise the power of sale in good faith, uh, having regard to his or her own interests, but not disregarding the interests of the mortgagor. And part and parcel of that um, obligation um, is to obtain um, the best price for the property, uh, the best price obtainable, consistent with the right of the mortgagee to realise the security. Um, traditionally, uh, once a sale, um, once a contract is in place, the traditional view was that, that the only um, ground for restraining uh, a mortgagee uh, from completing the contract was uh, lack of uh, bona fides or good faith, but uh, the more modern view allows... Um, uh, goes wider than that. Can I um, interpose from a practical point of view? It's, it's trite to observe that when clients come to uh, seek legal help, they're not coming with pre-formulated legal questions usually, but with a grievance that they find themselves in a position where they're facing, I'm, I'm speaking of the mortgagors that, that David's been addressing, that they're facing this action by a mortgagee. And that, that frequently the quest of the solicitor is to stop the sale. That's quite understandable from a client's point of view. But um, certainly my earlier experience is in the New South Wales courts and you'd get practice court application equivalents up there in front of the duty judge where um, 
the application would be articulated in terms of grievance, why it's unfair for a sale to go ahead, why the mortgagor's position is so close to being able to be resolved that the sale shouldn't go ahead. Um, do you find, David, that frequently a mortgagor will come up with an, or rather their lawyers, will come up with an unformulated application and that the courts are often being asked just to do something to relieve the grievance rather than articulating it in terms of the rights they've got? Uh, that's, th that's absolutely correct and uh, um, often um, it's difficult for the, the court to focus on what is the, the real issue with an interlocutory injunction application and that is, is there a serious issue to be tried? And then if, if and only if there is, then you proceed to the balance of convenience test. But um, uh, the temptation uh, for a lot of mortgagors is to, is to go straight to balance of convenience um, and, and it be can become fairly emotive as well. So uh, in the papers recently there was a, a report of a uh, a mortgagee sale, uh, a proceeding concerning a mortgagee sale in the Supreme Court um, and one of the um, arguments uh, of the, um, uh, the mortgagor's tenant in fact was that uh, oh we, we really love the house and we're hoping to be there for Christmas uh, dinner, Christmas lunch, uh, we want to have our, our children's 21st birthday parties there, well of course that that, that's all very well, uh, but um, uh, it rather uh, obscures, if you like, the, 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 the legal issues that, that the court really has to address. So, uh, more specifically, um, uh, with an interlocutory injunction application, um, it uh, needs to be shown, as I've said, that there is a serious issue to be tried uh, and that the balance of convenience favours the injunction being granted and also there's the added requirement that damages will not be an adequate remedy. That needs to be demonstrated. Um, in this respect, um, the, uh, the case that, that, sh uh, that tells us what the applicable um, test is, is uh, Australian Broadcasting Corporation versus O'Neill. That's a 2006 High Court decision. That's the, the final word for the time being on what's required for uh, injunction uh, uh, applications including interlocutory ones. Now, there's a couple of what, what can the, the mortgagor actually, um, actually uh, say? Well, um, it could say that um, it didn't receive uh, any uh, notice of default or demand but um, a lot of, lot of mortgages have deemed service provisions anyway uh, and that argument may not get you too far. The, the, these, the, these are examples of the serious issue to be tried. Uh, the, the other argument might be that there was um, that uh, the mortgage or um, was not in default uh, at all in the first place, um, and uh, uh, the, uh, if there's a notice or demand being given, as there usually would, you challenge it. Uh, you challenge the document on the basis that uh, no default grounds it. Uh, the most the most common argument, of course, would be about uh, how much is owing. There'll be a dispute about the notice or the demand will set out what the mortgagee claims and the mortgagor will say, well, that's not the right figure. Um, that's by far and away the most common argument. I suppose I can also, um, I can also mention that um, peculiar to um, this particular area of law, that is to say mortgagee sales, there's a further requirement. It's the requirement in English uh, versus Commonwealth uh, Trading Bank of Australia. It's a 1972 High Court case. Um, it's it's um, uh, rusted on, if you like, to the law relating to uh, mortgagee sales and that is a requirement that the mortgagor either tender or pay into court um, the amount uh, which is agreed to be due under the mortgage or if, if, if there is dispute, which there very often is, uh, the sum which the mortgagee uh, says is payable um, together with costs. Uh, that's that's a um, not inflexible rule, but it's a very important one. Is it, um, it, I think it takes applicants by surprise sometimes when a judge asks whether the party's prepared and ready and able to do that. Is it an invariable requirement? Um, no, it's not, but it, it uh, one, uh, a mortgage or needs to be prepared for it. Um, um, that's quite right, it, it, it often does come as a surprise. 
uh, these applications, remember, are usually brought on uh, in great haste uh, if it's uh, blocking a, um, a mortgagee selling. Of course, the, the mortgagor would have uh, has probably left things till the last minute, probably knew about it some time before. I mean, for one thing, that the, there would have been a, a writ for possession, uh, presumably. Most, most mortgagees like to get possession of a, of a house before they sell it. So, um, and, and there would have been a, not a notice or demand earlier on. But in the event, um, by the time a mortgagor um, gets angry enough to do something, it's usually the day before. But um, to answer that question directly, um, no, it is not an absolutely invariable requirement, the, the English requirement. Um, there are uh, some, um, some examples where um, there is no need to, to tender or pay into court. Um, if, if the amount uh, claimed by the mortgagee is obviously excessive, the court won't require payment. Um, if the validity of the, the mortgage, the entire mortgage is an issue, uh, likewise, and that might be um, uh, a fairly recent example of that is the SAI, TSAI uh, line of cases which um, related to um, mortgages were ex which were expressed to be uh, securing all monies. Um, and then uh, you have an underlying loan agreement uh, and that's rendered void because of uh, fraud. Um, so you end up with um, the, mortgage the mortgage securing uh, whatever is referred to in the loan agreement, but the loan agreement is, is dead in the water and therefore the mortgage secures a sum of zero and therefore there can't be a default. So in, in that situation, if there's, a, if there's an allegation that um, the mortgage is uh, invalid, then there's no need to pay in and um, also if, if there's a... Um, if there's a debate about the mortgagee's entitlement to, to sell at all, um, say for instance because the, the precondition of giving a notice or demand is, is not met or there's uh, supposedly no breach in the first place. But apart from those situations, um, the mortgagor is unlikely to get any relief without, without tendering. Uh, in New South Wales, um, one uh, res recourse for a, I won't say desperate mortgagor, but desperate mortgagor, was to comb through the, um, the notice, the Section 57 2B notice, as they're called under the Real Property Act in New South Wales, because the requirements of the notice were statutorily set out and quite strictly construed, so that if you could show, for example, that interest hadn't been properly calculated or that there was some uh, formal default that was often a chance to buy a mortgage or uh, more time, if nothing else. Um, Robert, what are the notice requirements in Victoria? Um, our legislation here doesn't have any formal notice requirements and that has led at times to um, mortgagees relying on, on quite informal documents. Um, but fortunately last year there was a decision called Wild and G Mortgage, uh, 19, 200, uh, 2012 VSC 212, where Justice Croft dealt extensively with what's required by a notice in, in Victoria. Um, and what he said was it clearly has to be a notice, that is a demand requesting a payment. You can't just have a document that tells the mortgage mortgagor that they're in default and that interest is accruing. That's not, uh, uh, that won't comply with the Act. So you actually have to have a document that appears to be a notice to a, a reasonable reader, a demand, and setting out the consequences if the demand's not met. Um, it's quite a good discussion in the case anyway. Um, but it is important to make sure that the document is clearly a request for something to be done and that it's to be taken seriously. That's really what it comes down to. Um, is a notice invalid if it overstates the amount that's payable? No, there's quite a lot of law on that. Notices are not invalid um, because of mere overstatement. However, a notice will be invalid if it refers to a default which was not in fact a default. Um, but overstatement's okay. That won't render the notice invalid. But you refer to a, a non-default as a ground for serving the notice and that will render the notice invalid. That's also dealt with extensively in that wild case. Um, if a um, notice is completely misleading, in other words, it's just out of all proportion to what, what the demand is, which the demand should be, can also be invalid. Um, so it's really three grounds. Mm -hmm. And um, what about service of the notice? Is that 
are there formal requirements for that? Well, you've always got to look at your, at your um, mortgage, um, but if that doesn't really help you as a mortgagee, you can always revert to Section 113 of the Transfer of Land Act, which has extensive um, provisions there for service of notices. You can look at um, addresses on the register, uh, things like that. So there's all sorts of ways you can serve these documents. If we continue to consider the application from the mortgagee's point of view, what are some of the factors that a mortgagee uh, should take into account when they're deciding to exercise their power of sale? Well, one thing that's forgotten these days, often, but still actually quite important, is if there's an atonement clause in the, in the, in the mortgage. That means that the, there's a clause in there that makes the mortgage or a tenant of the, la of the mortgagee. If there is such a clause, and most mortgages will still have them, you should terminate the... Um, terminate the tenancy created by the atonement clause before doing anything because otherwise <laughs> you'll be able to get the type of injunction that, that David's been talking about. Um, the, those clauses are still in, these, still in mortgages to enable, um, if, for example, the, the statutory power of sale becomes available, you can rely on the atonement clause to actually sell the land. That's one reason why they're still in there. You can, uh, the, so, so if you can't rely on the statutory provision to sell, you could still rely on the internment clause as the landlord to sell the land. But it is important to terminate the, uh, the lease if there is one in, the, in your mortgage. What would you say are risks of um, what we might euphemistically call self-help steps to obtain possession if you're a mortgagee? Well, um, you've got to be very careful about self-help. There's a crime called forcible entry in the Summary Offences Act. Um, everyone used to refer to a provision in the Crimes Act, Section 207, but that is in fact been repealed, though. Most people seem to ignore that. The provision is now in the uh, Summary Offences Act. Um, so you've got to be very careful about self-help. Um, also, apart from the criminal aspect, you've got to be very careful about things like false imprisonment, assaults, um, I do a lot of leasing work and I regularly see self-help cases um, and, you know, the police turn up, security guards get involved, it can be very messy. So the safest route for a mortgagee is to use writs for possession. Perhaps the most... Um, well, no, can I just add, yeah, add one, uh, one small thing to that, if I may, that um, it's, not, it's quite clear from uh, the statute, the Transfer of Land Act, Section 77, that the uh, mortgagee has the power of sale uh, once um, a notice or demand has been given and the period of one month or whatever, whatever other period is applicable has expired. There's not a requirement that the mortgagee be in possession before selling. A mortgagee could seek possession theoretically after a sale, but in the case of a house, uh, for instance, it, uh, it's uh, usually considered advisable to get rid of the occupants of the house to enable it to be properly marketed and inspected and so on. So usually um, usually uh, possession proceeding will precede uh, the sale, but technically that's not necessary. Could I just also add something to that? And that is that um, if there are, for example, tenants there without a proper lease and the price is depressed because possession is not taken, um, that could also come back to haunt the, uh, the mortgagee in not, not obtaining the best possible price. One of the more vexed issues in applications uh, concerns the manner in which the sale has been conducted, so much so that that is where the rubber hits the road in terms of uh, forcing a mortgagor to seek legal help. And it's almost by working backwards that complaints are articulated as to whether or not indebtedness is really um, accurately made out and, and things of that nature. I had mentioned earlier that there seems to be an inherent conflict of interest between mortgagor and mortgagee as to whose interests are being protected and to what extent one has to give way to the other. I think um, it's worth slowing down the discussion and focusing on specific steps in the conduct of the sale itself. Um, Robert, can it be sold by private contract or does it have to be sold by auction to ascertain a market no, it can be sold by private contract and um, while public auction would be the most common form of sale, there's no doubt that it can be sold by private contract and, and often is. Um, does it have to be advertised in a particular way? Um, well, advertising itself is not 
um, compulsory, but you would normally expect a proper process to take place. The circumstances in which... Uh, there's been a couple of cases, leading cases, about sale by private contract. There was one case that went to the Court of Appeal here where the mortgagee um, sold to a tenant of the premises. Now, those... In that case, there was no advertising done and the mortgagee got very upset. But what, what happened was the mortgagee actually had valuations done which were lower than the price offered by the tenant. Um, and so the price offered by the, the tenant, uh, that was based on a sworn valuation that it obtained, was fine. The court said, well, that's, that's the price and that clearly, um, clearly is, a, is a reasonable price. And so the, the mortgagee's complaints got nowhere in that circumstance. Uh, I wish to express no cynicism about valuations, <laughs> but um, is it advisable to obtain um, valuation evidence if you're a mortgagee? If I was a mortgagee, I'd always obtain sworn valuation evidence, if I wanted to sell privately, particularly. I mean, you know, there's no invariable rule here, but if you wanted to protect yourself, that's what you would have to do. Because that's all that will be available to a court to ascertain... In indeed. ...the touchstone, as it were, of the in proper sale. And in can I say also, even if you're selling by... Uh, you as mortgagee are selling by auction, you've got to be able to set a reserve. So that's right. you might need a valuation uh, in that circumstance too. Yes, that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, there have been other situations where private sales have taken place. Um, there's a famous case here called uh, Lagudi, and again there was a failure to advertise there, um, but the mortgagee had actually obtained prior to this sale um, valuations, uh, uh, sorry, expected sale prices at a public auction, and those Th those valuations, th sorry, those expected sale price estimates from experts assumed public advertising and a public auction. The mortgagee then sold privately at a higher price than all those estimates and again the mortgagee uh, didn't have any problems in doing that. The court said, look, there's no evidence you would have ever got a higher price at a public auction with advertising, so the mortgagee was, didn't have a problem. We've got a situation where a mortgagee's chief concern is to realise the security property and cover the, the loan, um, whereas the mortgagor is foregoing the beautiful house in which they hope to have Christmas lunch for the, for the rest of their lives. Um, can a mortgagee in advertising um, do so in an opportunistic way, by which I mean, um, you know, rush, 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 hurry, hurry, fire, sell, price, desperate mortgagor, must sell, bargain basement prices in order to optimise the chance of people turning up? Well, I, I don't think a court would have any problems with the type of advertising that you're talking about, but certainly in Victoria it can be advertised as a mortgagee's sale and is commonly done so in New South Wales less often. Mm. Um, so in terms of describing the property, let's, let's take a less extreme example than that. What care, if any, has to be taken in describing the property in well, advertising? A mortgagee should be very careful to properly describe the property, describe the attributes of the property. Um, there's a classic case uh, which was here in the Victorian Court of Appeal concerning land in Queensland where um, the land was advertised in Victoria the <laughs> using Melbourne real estate agents and a real estate agent in Queensland but not in the relevant part of Queensland and the property, all it did was, d all the advertising described was the area of the property and nothing else. Now, the Court of Appeal here really slammed the mortgagor over that and the mortgagee, sorry, um, slammed the mortgagee over that and the mortgagor was successful. So, in, in advertising in land, you'd expect proper professional style advertising. Um, if it obviously, it has to depend on the nature of the land about how much is spent on doing this. But if it's expensive land with certain attributes, they would have to be highlighted. You'd expect a proper advertising process. Um, David, could a hapless owner faced with that sort of bargain, bargain basement advertising um, use that as a basis for complaint in an application to set aside a sale? Well, yes, yes and no. Um, the um, bottom line is that the mortgagor really has to show that uh, the mortgagee has failed to obtain the best price obtainable. Uh, that's, that's the test. So um, if, um, despite uh, the advertising or lack of it, if, if the price is right, <laughs> so to speak, then um, it all becomes a bit rather academic as to whether um, the advertisement uh, missed um, some feature of the land or whatever. 
Um, this is for either of you gentlemen. Um, can a mortgagor complain that they haven't been consulted about the conduct of a sale or should a mortgagee refer to a mortgagor in the conduct of the sale? A mortgagee does not have to refer to the mortgagor, although often does, particularly if there's, um, it's a special piece of land or got certain attributes or it might be, there might be business being conducted there. Um, but uh, but it's just as a matter, strict matter of, of law, no mortgagee does not have to refer to the mortgagor about the sale process. And, and at that point, of course, the parties are often at loggerheads and writing angry letters and so on, so the, the prospect of collaboration uh, is rather diminished in, in, in the usual scenario. Thank you. The frisson in the room tells me that there are people immediately rushing to their office to write vicious letters at what they notice has been happening in their own matters and that probably caffeine levels are drooping. So can we now have a 10-minute break?